what do you see as like the future, the big impact that AI can make positively in society, but also how is this going to affect work, white collar work, blue collar work, et cetera? Yeah, I think I think for me, I mean, the blue and white collar split and like, you know, what is the average income of the kind of job you're disrupting by that classifying what AI disrupts, disrupts and whatnot, I think might not be the right way to cut it, even though that's how I guess most people cut it. I think about it more in terms of like, how many like data modalities do you have to interact with both on where you get data from and where you create data. And so like jobs where you pretty much just interact with one data modality and maybe don't need to interact with much with people, the physical world. Um, and that could be a lawyer, but that could be also somebody in customer support. Both jobs, I mean, you're if you're if it's text-based customer support or a lawyer, it's also text-based, it's often like contracts. You're interacting with, you know, you're reading what either the customer writes or what your client maybe wants in an email. So both the text and then you create stuff, right? You answer in customer support or as a lawyer, um, you basically draft a contract. Now, one thing is much more complex maybe than the other, and that's why the person gets paid more. But in the end, it's the same kind of modality you interact with and some of the same process from an AI perspective. And so I think both things will just corrupt it. And we've seen that for an LLM, it doesn't make matter so much if the, the, the topic is more complex or less complex. It's just a matter of, do you have the data around this topic? And then you throw it in and then it's going to be really good. And so both things will probably be or definitely be disrupted, but it's not by, um, you know, um, pure salary or white versus blue collar or more complex, less complex task. Um, whereas like, I guess jobs that, you know, especially with the, interact with the physical world, where you need probably robots to do the tasks, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, like uh, care in elderly homes or, you know, like nurses or or maybe even service and restaurant, um, but maybe also management jobs that are a lot about meeting people also in person, um, you know, resolving conflicts, like um, these kind of things maybe take longer to disrupt because you need to interact with a lot of different mod modalities. Um, and that that becomes harder because you're you also have text, you have presentations, you have calls, you need to meet people in person, you need to travel. Like that kind of stuff will be be harder to replace. Um, but I think these singular mod modality things, I think there we will see more progress. And but I think I mean we also start to see more AI models that are better with multimodal. I mean images and text, obviously, but um, maybe also for for pharma, including biological data. There's some multimodal models now that also you know then can work with robotics and with robots and also text so that will also maybe expand the scope but i think you know ultimately all these jobs will will be changed for some some parts will be of a job maybe will be fully disrupted i don't think the lawyer as a total will be disrupted but there will probably be maybe some of the easier litigation cases like what we try to disrupt will be disrupted now you're in a billion dollar private equity this transaction where it doesn't matter how much the lawyer costs but and you can't afford single mistakes and you don't mind paying like 10 people that maybe will disrupt it later so I think it's often also just certain chunks, even within customer support, some of the easy requests are already automated. Now, some of the more complex ones, you know, you still need to talk at some point to an agent because just all, not all the data is in the system. And so I think we'll see certain parts of the jobs getting disrupted and as such also maybe job profiles change because, you know, like it's not the same job as it was like now uh, in 10 years. And so it will be very vibrant. I think in like 10 years, the, the work world will look very different, but ultimately for every day we work, I think we will be more productive um, because there will be stuff that we can automate and that's exciting. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you selected lawyer there for a lot of your examples when that same kind of single modality, especially when you think about, I mean, me since the pandemic, I'm completely remote. And so data science work, software development work, this is really, this is strings of text that we're creating. We're taking in uh, natural language instructions, maybe from a project manager or a user or an executive and converting those natural language instructions into strings of code. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, like, I know, I know your your audience and listeners. I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to, you know, talk too much against them. But at the same time, I mean, many of you are using Copilot and similar tools, so um, are getting supported when when writing code. And I think we again will see the supercharge of the the software developers um, and some parts maybe humans will not write the code anymore. And, you know, maybe as many software developers will more uh, move into a, you know, like a architecture design kind of role. And then a lot of the actual code will be written by machines. Um, 
So in that sense, software developers are also moving up the stack. Um, so I think that's interesting, which, which is like, so you somehow do less, but you will do the more complex thing because you might have right. to, like in a very abstract way, figure out what you want to build and then the whole coding somebody else will do, like the machine. Um, yeah. But it doesn't mean the task is easier. It's the same with like, I guess, when, when teachers now complain about like um, students like not writing their essays anymore because ChatGPT writes them for them. Sure, but like then, like telling ChatGPT how to write it to answer the question. Well, that's and then reviewing what ChatGPT wrote and you know iterating. That's kind of more what the teacher does. It's like grading it, right? And like trying to optimize for the best grade. And you could argue that that's a harder role than actually writing it. Um. So, right. Yeah, I think we'll just use these tools or get more productive and and our jobs will change. And that's exciting. And yeah, yeah. I agree. It it moves us up the value chain. Uh, a talk that I gave in uh, early 2023 centered around this idea of the data scientist, thanks to these foundational LLMs, things like GPT-4, um, it allows data scientists to become more like a data product manager. Because you can be thinking about, you can just think about what would be the ideal model for my users, and then you can be orchestrating one or more of, as you say, you said somebodies of these machine somebodies to be, you know, you can be delegating different parts of the work and you can be uh, generating the data or simulating the data that you need to create really powerful models. Um, or you can be leveraging um, existing LLM foundation models or fi fine tuning them to your needs. So there's suddenly all these ways, whether it's with code generation or access to models uh, be they open source or proprietary that allow us as data scientists to be way more powerful than ever before. And so, you know, we can spend less of our time down in the weeds of trying to get some two different libraries to interact together the way that we want, or, you know, to uh, generate the code for a neural network. Those kinds of things can be automated and we can focus on bigger picture, higher value things like what does our user really need and how can I use this abundance these, this abundance of tools in order to deliver on that need but like coming back to the points i mean exactly this interaction with the user and understanding the needs that's again like you probably need to switch a lot of different modalities you need to talk to the users you need to physically go there you need to see them interact with the product um you need to have then conversations feedback like it's a lot of like different data sources where your information comes from and the more complex that becomes the more it still needs the human but then once you know what you want, turning that into product, you know, that's just in a single modality. And that's then, you know, just write a ton of code, generate that, and then uh, have it work. And then you go again back to the user. So uh, it kind of fits in that framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great discussion there. And I think that ultimately, for me at least, it seems like all of the historical research suggests that these kinds of things, while the work changes while we need to be adaptable as data scientists or entrepreneurs to this fast moving AI ecosystem. Ultimately, all of the automations historically, and there's, I mean, sometimes people are like, maybe this time is different, but any other historical automation has led to more jobs than fewer. And so based on that historical precedent, it seems like this AI transformation that we're currently undergoing will simultaneously lead to more jobs. Um, and, and that is what we're seeing. I'm, it could be other economic factors that are involved potentially right now, but it is interesting that at this same time in history that we're seeing AI proliferate and advance at a speed never seen before, simultaneously we're seeing the, some of the lowest unemployment rates in decades or ever in economies all over the world. Yeah. And I mean, we also have to keep in mind that for many roles, I mean, you know, we have a, a lack of people just doing the job. I mean, for a lot of lower skilled jobs, um, for a lot of rural areas, it's very hard to sometimes find, you know, like doctors in like the countryside um, or, you know, people and the customer support at scale. And so people struggle with that also with like a lot of like geopolitics, like there's more reshoring, like nearshoring again. So people are bringing maybe some processes back, back to the country, to the US or to Europe. and you need a lot of people for that and we don't have them. I mean, we're, we're making two little babies, like, you know, um, in that sense, you know, also with the baby boomers all retiring now, there's a high demand for like, um, you know, more, more people and workforce. And 
we just don't have it. So the only way we can even just keep our current system running is supercharge the people we have that work with AI. And so that's why it's 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 really important um, to keep kind of society going uh, in the next decade. Yeah, and I guess we see that in places like Japan, where they have one of the oldest average ages, one of the smallest uh, workforce to retired population ratios. They also have, I believe, the highest rate of uh, robotics um, adoption. Yeah, it's the same. It's like uh, for elderly care, do you want to have a robot caretaker? I don't know. But do you want to have a robot caretaker rather than nobody? Probably yes, right? So I think, um, and maybe at some point we like it more, right? Like we don't know yet. I mean, that takes some time adoption. Depends on how good it is. But I think sometimes I think we also need to face reality here. Um, yeah. Where we are right now with, with kind of global society. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, so like you asking that question, like you kind of think, do you want your uh, your elderly parent or grandparent to be taken care of by a human or a robot? Maybe today you say the answer is human uh, because, you know, that feels like you're kind of doing more of the right thing. They have more interaction. But it could very well be the case that in the not too distant future, maybe even today in specific circumstances, you could have a robot that is actually way better than a human because, you know, let's say, you know, somebody has advanced Alzheimer's, a human can't have the patience to just be constantly reminding about the same things, whereas a robot can have infinite patience and can yeah. maybe do a much better job even today in that kind of scenario. Yeah, and is never tired and is always in a good mood and, you know, is always reliable. And I think it needs to, a certain point of just accuracy. And then I think it also works. And also, I mean, you know, if, if there's not enough people, we don't have choice. I think it's the same for customer support. I think that's always a great example. Like, 10 years ago, I mean, I hated chatting with these customer support bots because they were so stupid. Um, I mean, the, the the language one. Now, I mean, sometimes I don't really know anymore who I actually talk to if it's like a like a LLM or a human because the LLMs start to get so good. And I, I mind it actually less because I know, you know, if the LLM solves my problem, um, you know, then, then it's great. And um, so I think it needs to hit a certain accuracy. And then also like, if the waiting time to get to a human operator is like 45 minutes, um, I may maybe even more fine with taking up with the with the chatbot. So I think I think it's just a matter of time getting there for most applications to get to this accuracy and also get to uh, the availability we have. Yeah, I think uh, Alan Turing, when he was thinking up the Turing test, he was very fascinated by the customer service need. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and now we have... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and now, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, when I'm when I'm speaking to a customer ser customer service chatbot, uh, especially in in the last twelve months, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, like you're saying, I, I I just said chatbot, but actually, I don't even know <laughs> in so many circumstances. And so, yeah, the Turing test has been passed, uh, which yeah, interesting implications for just how we monitor AI because for so many decades it was like, well, this is the this is the benchmark of you know, uh, humans having uh, the same kind of capabilities or machines having the same kind of capabilities as humans. And now we see, well, it actually, that particular use case that the Turing test was designed for yeah. ended up being one of the things that we were able to master um, relatively a, easily. In AI terms. Yeah. yeah, and it's funny, right? right? Because now, now, I mean, you know, if, if an LLM has read more data than a human could ever read in their lifetime and, you know, right you know, you suddenly can create actually models that, that outperform humans at many things. And that's, that's, that's really cool. I mean, maybe, yes, it's a bit scary, but ultimately you also have to be realistic that all the data that's based on is data that we could have set, seen, maybe not everything at the same time. And so yeah. maybe the AI get, will get new context in your reasoning and see things we wouldn't have seen like between different data points, but overall, I guess, bits and pieces we could have, could have looked at ourselves. So, um, yeah, I think that that area is one of the most fascinating for potentially even in 2024, us seeing some big breakthroughs. Um, so things like the rumored uh, QSTAR at OpenAI, where instead of just being an autocomplete uh, like GPT-4 is on knowledge on you know likely strings, likely concepts from things that we already know, um, something like QSTAR, this ability to uh, be able to take um, elements and be able to combine them together into something new uh, and draw new conclusions is yeah it's certainly really exciting and um, uh, you know these these kinds of ideas allowing us again kind of augmenting scientists or engineers so that they can be making um, 
conclusions. And so like you're saying, the LLM knows far more than the human. And so trained on a database of all the scientific literature in somebody's specialization, um, these these AI systems, maybe even of today, but certainly in the near future, I suspect in 2024, will be able to um, to make suggestions on you know research ideas or relevant papers, um, experimental ideas that where you know the, the human just can't possibly keep up with all the literature. And this also a natural extension of that. There's no reason why the AI model has to be just trained on. The scientific literature in one vertical, it can be across all verticals. And so all of a sudden now you can have this machine that is um, pulling ideas from lots of different uh, traditionally siloed verticals and making suggestions, maybe even on who you could be collaborating with. So, um, you know, based on, yeah, so there's, there's huge, huge um, augmentations of, of human intelligence that I, that I think these kinds of examples are, are going to be happening very soon if they aren't already today. Yeah, and I mean, like it's, I mean, I think we just need to be modest as humans that ultimately, I mean, we're just, we have limited brain capacity. We have, you know, limited data we can take in and, and put out. And, um, you know, there will be just areas where machines will be bigger, better, quicker, faster. And that's cool. Let's leverage them and let's let's have an impact.